well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Hopefully you had a great weekend. Glad that you're back with us here on the program. Can I believe that it is already almost March? I have no idea where the time has gone, but we are at it once again. And uh, is it just me? Or do the arguments from gun control activists appear to be getting dumber? Um, started out uh, bearing arms today, talking about the uh, tweet from David Hogg, who asserting that uh, you don't have a right to own a gun. Second Amendment never protected a right to own a gun. It was all about a right of states to have militias, which uh, is not the case. As took great pleasure in uh, pointing out, but this is not the only bit of. Um, I hate to use the word idiocy because we are talking about very educated people here. Uh, but it is not the only <laughs> dubious claim, let's put it that way, uh, made by gun control activists. So I ran across this story um, from a climate change uh, website. What's it called? The Cool Down. Yes, The Cool Down with its uh, headline, New Study Finds Tragic Factor Contributing to Thousands of of gun deaths nationwide. Global warming. They say as temperatures across the country soar and unseasonably warm days continue, the number of gun deaths across the country has gone up. Nearly 8,000 gun shootings can be attributed to extreme temperatures, according to research published by the JAMA Network. The study analyzed 100 major U.S. cities with the highest proportion of gun violence between 2015 and 2020, and it found that out of more than 116,000 shootings, almost 7%, they say, were attributable to above average temperatures. Yeah. Um, the cooldown notes that gun violence, as well as other types of violence, such as road rage, is known to worsen in the summer. Warmer temperatures increase the body's uh, stress hormones in the nervous system, which may heighten violent impulses. People also spend more time outdoors when the weather is warm, which makes encounters with others and the potential for lethal clashes more likely, they say. And they say that, uh, quote, it only takes a small rise in temperature to push instances of gun violences up. In fact, they say the study found that more shootings were attributable to moderately hot days than to extremely hot ones. This escalation in violence isn't linked to any specific temperature range. They note instead an increase in the city's average temperature was all it took to drive up shootings. Now, I, I will confess, I am a little skeptical of these claims. Um, I, I think it is true, by the way, that violence goes up in the summer. That, I think, is documented. Uh, the summer months are typically the most violent months of the year. So, if it's getting warmer, I suppose it, it's, it's plausible then that uh, in these increased temperatures would lead to an increase in violence. The problem, well, there are a lot of problems with that. But let, let, let's start with the fact that uh, this study only looked at a five-year range between 2015 and 2020. Why would they do that? If global warming has been going on for decades, then clearly this association would be seen if you go back decades. But it's not. Um, this is a, a graph of the homicide victimization rate, the number of homicides per 100,000 people in the United States between 1950 and 2005. Now, it stops in 2005, although I will say that violent crime and the homicide rate continued to decline from 2005 right up through 2019. We saw the spike in 2020. And you can see there homicide rate largely flat throughout the 1950s and early 1960s, and then it really starts to go up in the late 1960s. Doubles, right, between 1951 and, let's say, 1975 or 76, from about uh, five homicides per 100,000 people to almost 10. There's a little drop in the middle or the late 70s, picks back up again in the early 1980s, uh, drops again slightly, uh, in the uh, mid-80s, then picks back up until the 1990s. And it's not until 1991 that we start to see the homicide rate decline. And the homicide rate declined pretty much every year between 1991 and 2020, which shouldn't happen if global warming is leading to an increase in violence and the planet is getting hotter. Well, 
why didn't we see that rise in violent crime exponentially? Why haven't we seen that rise in homicides exponentially, right? Or at least, if not exponentially, at least a slow, steady increase year after year as the planet warms up. Hasn't happened. In fact, if you notice, the spike in the late 1960s and the early 1970s happened right about the same time when climate activists were uh, calling uh, for uh, alarm about a global cooldown, right? An impending ice age. So the planet was getting colder and violent crime is rising. Now we're being told, that, well, violent crime is rising because the planet's getting hotter. About the only good thing that I can say about this study is that it does not call for more gun control laws, specifically uh, as a policy prescription. Instead, they talk about the uh, the need to plant more green spaces, right? Have more gardens, more trees in uh, uh, urban environments, which they say can bring down the uh, the heat of cities, but also can reduce violent crime. And I have no problem whatsoever with uh, efforts to beautify cities. Do I think that it is going to have a major impact on violent crime? No, I don't. But at least it doesn't harm the fundamental right to keep and bear arms in self-defense, unlike most of the things that gun control activists are calling for. So uh, I, again, I have a lot of problems with this theory that uh, global warming is leading to increased violent crime. But um, <clears throat> if they want to plant more trees as a result, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to lend my support. As long as they're not actually going after our right to keep and bear arms, they can uh, advocate for whatever the heck they want anyway. All right, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a uh, case out of New York, Syracuse, New York, and the uh, local paper in uh, Syracuse uh, with an editorial about the murder of 11-year-old Brexley Torres Ortiz, allegedly at the hands of a 15-year-old, uh, which they say exposed a failure of the juvenile justice system. But did politicians get the message? Given that this is New York we're talking about, I'm guessing the answer is no. That rather than look at the failures of the juvenile justice system, New York lawmakers are going to look at the murder of this 11-year-old and say, oh, how did a 15-year-old get a hold of a gun? Clearly, our gun control laws aren't strong enough. Clearly, we must do more to crack down on the rights of law-abiding people in the hopes of preventing criminals from illegally accessing firearms. But as the uh, editorial board at Advanced Media in New York writes, um, the murder of Torres Ortiz, just 11 years old, shows that the state's juvenile justice system has some serious issues. As they write, a story by staff writer Marnie Eisenstadt manages to pierce this veil of secrecy regarding the uh, juvenile justice system, relying largely on anonymous sources who can't speak publicly due to privacy laws. Previous reporting has shown that Syracuse has among the worst rates in the nation for juveniles charged with homicide. Many of those teenage defendants stood before a judge at one time or another and yet ultimately were not diverted from committing the worst crime of all. In this case, however, this 15-year-old suspect who has a lengthy criminal history, was in fact sent to what they call a um, boarding school for troubled youths, uh, Lincoln Hall in Westchester County. Um, this 15-year-old had been arrested 10 times already when he was accused of murder. Uh, gun possession charges, car theft, ramming a police car during a chase. As advanced media in NY- Wonders how those charges are, or states, how those charges played out in Onondaga County Family Court is a secret to protect the youth's privacy. But again, we know that he was out and illegally in possession of a gun when he allegedly shot and killed this 11-year-old. Um, again, according to sources, this 15-year-old had been sentenced to 10 months in Lincoln Hall, that, quote, boarding school for troubled youths, the least restrictive setting. That recommendation, um, or that sentence also recommended by the county probation department. As Advanced New York wonders, would like to know why they thought this level of detention was appropriate for a youth charged with such serious crimes. By law, the paper says, youths sent to Luke, uh, Lincoln Hall have a right to family visits. The question is whether or not this 15-year-old should have been allowed to come home at all, or if authorities should have been notified when he did come home, given concerns about his activities while he was visiting Syracuse. 
Uh, last August, the parties involved in the 15-year-old's case met to discuss his potential access to a gun and social media activity involving guns and gang members, but the judge allowed the home visits to continue. And it was on one of those home visits again when he allegedly obtained a firearm and used it to murder an 11-year-old girl. Advanced Media NY says, well, the judge bears the ultimate responsibility for that decision. Many others had input into it. The county attorney, probation department, social services, police, the boy's family. Where do they go wrong and what do they miss? What can they do better? They need to get together to figure that out and be more open with the public about how they plan to make sure that it never happens again. And they say in the end, what happened in January is intolerable. The people who work in the juvenile justice system would do well to show the public that they got the message. I, again, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. In New York, they're going to blame the gun. They are going to say that the answer lies not with uh, improving the juvenile justice system, not with ensuring that teenagers who have been accused or convicted of very serious violent offenses actually have the opportunity for rehabilitation, but also are under direct supervision when they can go after the right to keep their arms instead. I think they're always going to take the easy choice, even if it means infringing on a fundamental right. Now, today's armed citizen story from Florida, where the uh, sheriff in Polk County says a citizen killed a suspect who shot at two people uh, inside a car in the uh, Poinciana neighborhood. This was uh, late last week. During a press conference, the sheriff, Grady Judge, says it appears that an argument happened in a, a large group uh, on Sawfish Drive there in uh, Polk County, and then gunshots were fired. Investigators say the shooter fired their weapon at two people in a car. But then again, an armed citizen who was present shot that suspect, killing him. Two people inside the car who were shot were listed in critical condition as of Thursday night. Sheriff says they are working to figure out what led up to both shootings, but it would appear again that the uh, second shots fired at the uh, suspect not fired in self-defense necessarily, but uh, in defense of another. We'll keep our eyes on this story, bring you more information as it becomes available. And finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, we'll able to do the right thing. A uh, Connecticut middle school teacher who ended up uh, saving a, a disabled man when his van caught fire. This was uh, Manchester, Connecticut. Uh, and uh, 38-year-old Heather Sika Leonard, who uh, teaches in Connecticut, but apparently, I, I guess, lives in Brooklyn, heck of a commute, uh, was, I guess, on her way. Uh, she was at uh, a nearby Bennett Academy to speak with a sixth grade students who will be in her orchestra next year. And uh, she was driving home down a different way than she normally goes. It was about uh, 3.15 on Friday when uh, she saw a burning van. Now. Rather than just call 911 and keep driving on the road, um, she stopped. The um, van was driven by a guy identified only as John. He um, smelled smoke while he was driving. He uses a wheelchair. He moved a cup holder and discovered flames coming from his dashboard. So that's when he pulls over, right? But he can't get out of his car easily. Um, that's when Sika Leonard pulls up, saw the flames, opens the door and pulls the driver out of the vehicle. Uh, she said, uh, I don't know if my mind is really processed yet what could have happened had I not been able to act. She said, He said, I'm handicapped and needed his wheelchair. The uh, van's electronics had stopped because of the fire, so the driver's seat, which swivels out, was stuck. His wheelchair was behind him. Um, she was able to open the van's door, but the added oxygen then fanned the flames. Um, she grabbed him grabbed his wheelchair, put it on the ground, held it as uh, he sat down. She said he was pretty capable of getting himself out of the driver's seat uh, into the wheelchair. Uh, at that point, firefighters had arrived. They were able to uh, extinguish the blaze, but uh, Manchester Fire Rescue EMS says that the uh, middle school teacher, quote, immediately stopped, approached the burning vehicle, selflessly got John in his wheelchair out of the car, and moved him to safety, all at great ris uh, personal risk of injury. Her actions averted an almost certain fatal outcome and prevented anyone from being injured. She said she didn't think twice about helping when the uh, flames were shooting out of the car. She said, I don't think I had that thought. My thought was, I just got to get them out. She said, I'm just happy the stars aligned for it to happen the way that it was supposed to. 
Yeah, me too. And I bet uh, John feels the very same way. Again, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. This uh, Connecticut middle school teacher, uh, Heather Sika Leonard, we thank you for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Almost all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. But I do want to give you a sneak peek at a couple of things that we are watching this week. Uh, Wednesday, permitless carry slated to be uh, debated and voted on on the floor of the Nebraska unit camera legislature. So LB 77 could actually pass. I, there's still some work being done behind the scenes. So I, I, I don't want to put the uh, cart before the horse here, but uh, we could see a vote on constitutional carry in Nebraska this week. Uh, could start to see movement on constitutional carry in South Carolina as well. It has passed out of the house. It is over in the state Senate side. And um, Governor Henry McMaster last week put his weight behind permitless carry, constitutional carry. Uh, And so hopefully that uh, will start moving in the Senate as well. Uh, Looks like things are teed up pretty well for permitless carry in Florida. But the session doesn't get underway until March the 4th. They've already sort of pre-gamed the bill through committee. So it looks like that might actually be one of the first priorities for Florida lawmakers. And then, of course, we're watching what's going on in uh, courthouses around the country as well. We still have challenges underway uh, to the uh, 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 ban on so-called assault weapons and magazines, large capacity magazines in Illinois. Uh, Still have uh, hearings and uh, lawsuits underway in New York that we'll be talking about at Bearing Arms this week. So it is a very busy time, both in terms of legislation Uh, and in terms of litigation. So I would encourage you, again, visit the website. Check us out every day here at Bearing Arms Cam and Company. We'll keep you up to date. And, of course, if you uh, like our reporting, I would obviously encourage you to become a VIP member. Your support is critically important to the work we do at Bearing Arms Cam and Company to keep you informed and uh, educated, hopefully entertained as well, a little bit. That's uh, That's the third least important of the uh, the three things we try to do. Uh, But if you do appreciate what we're doing at Bearing Arms, I would encourage you to become a VIP member. All you have to do, go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe, use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. Not only will we be supporting the independent pro segment of journalism that we do at Bearing Arms, but we're going to give you exclusive content, news stories, and analyses you won't find anywhere else, because your support does matter, and it really does make a difference. So thank you again. Looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. Until then, hope you have a great rest of your Monday. Be well, be safe, and be free.